From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello today, David. How are you? Very good. Good morning. Good morning. And we also have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. Just hold on to your seatbelts. You're going to be challenged. Yes, on the show today, we're going to welcome back journalist Dar Jamal. Last time Mr. Jamal was on the show, it was a little less than a year ago, and it was the 15th anniversary of the Iraq War. And Mr. Jamal told us about his reporting from Iraq, and in particular about the brutal Battle of Fallujah. But in addition to being a war correspondent, Mr. Jamal is also an avid mountain climber, it is in those mountains where he has witnessed another kind of violence, violence to the planet. Turns out that those mountain slopes are the front lines of the climate crisis. His book on the subject is entitled The End of Ice. And he's not talking about the immigration enforcement. He's literally talking about the melting, disappearing ice and its consequences for human life on the planet. He's going to take us beyond the abstract theoretical models, doing a true reporter's job, he has gone to where the action is. And as always, we will take a minute after that to check in with corporate crime reporter Russell Mokhyber. And then we're going to see if we can uh, empty our inbox as Ralph answers your latest questions. But first, let's find out where has all the ice gone. David? In late 2003, award-winning journalist Star Jamal went to the Middle East to report on the Iraq War, where he spent more than a year as one of only a few independent U.S. journalists in the country. Mr. Jamal has also written extensively on veterans' resistance against U.S. foreign policy. He is now focusing on climate disruption and the environment. His book on that topic is entitled The End of Ice. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Dar Jamal. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Thank you, Dar, for coming on. I just want to start with this remarkable book, by the way, listeners. You've never read a book like this. Dar goes to these places. He starts out with the Denali Mountains in Alaska, which he climbed, and he's gone to the coral reefs of Australia, gone to the Amazon, gone to South Florida as the waves lap up into that highly developed area, and gone to the western part of the United States, the mountains of California, and on and on. And that's the way he writes, and he combines that by interviewing the leading experts who are there who are working there, who never get much attention, and who've spent a lifetime trying to warn us about what's happening. Dar, I'm going to just read a paragraph on page 212. And listeners, don't turn off by the overwhelming nature of this, because you're turning off your posterity, your descendants, if you do that. And I'm quoting, quote, similarly, disrespect for nature is leading to our own destruction by desecrating the biosphere with our pollution and having caused Earth's sixth mass extinction by annihilating species around the planet, we are setting ourselves up for what I believe will be ultimately our own extinction. This is a direct result of our inability to understand our part in the natural world. We live in a world where we are acidifying the oceans, where there will be few places cold enough to support year-round ice, where all the current coastlines will be underwater. That, by the way, includes many of the major cities of the world, and where droughts, wildfires, floods, storms, and extreme weather are already becoming the new normal. During my years of reporting from Iraq, I felt a mixture of sadness, guilt, anger, powerlessness, anxiety, despair, and grief. I went to Iraq to report on how a violent, chaotic occupation was crushing the Iraqi people and shredding the fabric of their society and culture. End quote. Now, why did I quote this? Because you're dealing with an author who has both cognitive intelligence and emotional intelligence, and he comes at it, the issue of climate disruption. He refuses, as I do, to use the words climate change, as so many environmental groups do. It's climate catastrophe, climate crisis. If you don't believe it, read this book, The End of Ice. But we both come at this from different angles, Dar. I looked at your index. You didn't have an entry for Congress, the White House, or corporation. And that's what I want to talk to you about, in addition to your findings. 
because if we're going to change in any transformative manner from fossil fuels to nuclear into energy efficiency, renewable energy, if we're going to make all these other changes to save the oceans, the waters, the rivers, the mountains, from the Amazon to the Arctic where you went, whether we like it or not, we're going to have to go through Congress, which means we're going to have to look at ourselves in the mirror. Congress has been a disaster, as the White House has been. In 1993, there was a report by Bill Clinton and Al Gore warning about climate catastrophe. It had all kinds of pictures and graphs and urgency, and they put it on the shelf and did nothing. They gave the auto industry eight years of holiday and betrayed all their verbal warnings and concerns. And that included Gore, who wrote a book saying the motor vehicle is one of the greatest threats to the planet. So I want to ask you, how are you going to motivate people? By fear, by optimism, by a sense of posterity, or by zeroing in on Congress and the White House? Well, definitely not by fear. That's been batted around lately, fear and panic. It's time to panic. And I, I do not think that is the way to go for multiple reasons. But to cut to the chase and the risk of sounding extremely cliche, my goal of the book was to inspire people to reconnect to the planet. So the motivation I would cite that I am hoping for is love of the planet and all of the planet's beings that if we you know really reconnect and understand we are from and of this place and how we treat this place is directly how we treat ourselves and vice versa then we're going to start behaving differently and another angle on that same idea is that i interviewed a cherokee elder in the book named stan rushworth and he reminded me that the western colonial settler mindset is that we have rights what are my rights but his indigenous perspective is what are our obligations we are born onto this planet with obligations to take care of it because it's sacred and then obligations to do good work for future generations to protect the future generations so I hope that in reading this book, which is full of extremely intense information, as you said, but then when I get to the end of it and bring some of these indigenous voices and their stories into it, and my own experience of the journey I've taken from being so angry and just putting out information, and for a while I was trying to scare people, trying to anything possible to wake people up, but the book really changed my perspective that I, I don't take that tact anymore. And I hope that people are, are moved and motivated by love of the planet, love of each other, love of future generations, love of their we, children to do the right thing. We had on a few weeks ago, Paul Hawken, who I'm sure you know, and his book, The Ecology of Commerce, stimulated the transformation of the Interface Corporation, the biggest carpet tile manufacturer in the world based in Atlanta, under the leadership of the great late Ray Anderson. And he is into this movement around the world, and he put out a beautiful book on it called Drawdown. And he cites thousands of groups all over the world trying to save the water and clean the air and preserve the land and protect the forests, etc. And when I asked him, what is Drawdown? He said, reversing the carbon dioxide parts per billion. In other words, not just slowing it down with these greenhouse gases especially methane, but reversing it, you know, bringing it down. I guess it's about 410 or 420 parts per billion now. And it struck me that he was using optimism. He was saying, look, we've got to do something. I mean, let's not just fall into dread, anxiety, and fear. But from what you say in your book, The End of Ice, everything's accelerating and multiplying. So educate us about this multiplier effect, take Greenland and the permafrost and how it multiplies its deadly effect once the melting starts. That's right. So we actually just set a global record on February 9th, where the Mauna Loa Observatory measured daily average atmospheric CO2 concentration of 414.27 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. The last time there was this much CO2 in the atmosphere, the steady state temperature of the planet was 7 degrees C higher than right now, and sea levels were 23 meters higher than they are today. 
So at the current level of CO2 in the atmosphere, we're basically waiting for the planet to catch up with the injury that's already been done. So people like Hawken and others that are talking about the necessity, not just the goal, but you know, we, we don't have a chance unless we start drawing a massive amount of this CO2 out of the atmosphere. There is no question about that. The IPCC discusses that. Numerous other groups, there's a giant push in regenerative agriculture, which Hawken also mentions in his work. And all of that is absolutely imperative. Geoengineering, of course, is being thrown about more every day now. That is extremely worrisome. Explain that. That's more than carbon sequestration, driving the carbon dioxide into the ground and storing it there. Well, that's right. It's basically using, instead of regenerative agriculture and planting more trees and regenerating soil so it can sequester massive amounts of carbon and all of this, if done on a massively wide scale, like government mandated, funded, et cetera, then that could have a serious positive impact. But geoengineering, you bring man-made geoengineering into it, and it's things like let's put a giant balloon up in the stratosphere to try to block the sun from certain parts of the country and then simultaneously release different sulfides or iodines to reflect more of that sunlight back into the sky, back into space. And and so with unforeseen consequences, while those technologies are being discussed, other scientists are being very critical of them because look, okay, that would reflect the sunlight back into space, but then we have no idea how that would affect rainfall patterns across the globe. Like that could simultaneously cause major droughts across a prime agriculture areas, et cetera. So it's an extremely dangerous proposition. But then getting back to your original question of the feedback loop. So I outlined several of them in the book, but the most famous one being the melting and reduction of the Arctic summer sea ice. It's reducing dramatically at the current observational trend of decline. It looks like we'll probably, not for sure, but probably start having periods of ice-free summers in the Arctic over the ocean there within probably about five years from now, if not a little bit sooner. And so as that ice reduces, it exposes more of the blue ocean to absorb the sunlight, which warms the ocean faster, which melts the ice faster, which then causes the, so, so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Another way to put positive feedback loops are the more something happens, the more it happens. Like a deadly vicious circle, right? Precisely. Okay. Right. Let me get down to where people have more referential experience. South Florida. You went down to South Florida. This is a mind-blowing chapter called The Coming Atlantis. This is just one slice of what's happening. The insurance industry now is getting more concerned. There are some homes in South Florida cannot get 30-year mortgages. There are Miami Beach may disappear. Over half of Florida's population is just a few feet over sea level. The sea level is increasing. And at the same time, you had a eight years of Rick Scott, a former corporate criminal in the healthcare industry, as governor. And Rick Scott basically was a smaller version of Trump. He's now senator. People of Florida has elected him narrowly senator last November. Here's the quote that really caught my attention. And I'm quoting you, Dar Jamal, author of the book End Device. Quote, you could write an entire book on what would happen to industrial infrastructure in Florida as sea levels rise. But one major source of concern is the Florida aquifer. Once that water is contaminated by salt water, it's over. And some of the next experts I would speak with believe it was not a matter of if, but when that aquifer becomes contaminated. Describe the scene in South Florida, the homes that are going to be flooded, the kind of climate refugees that are going to be produced, the the head-in-the-sand nature of the political leadership, the one bright light where they're requiring new homes to be built with solar panels. Give us a sense, because our listeners, I found this out, you know, since the 1980s when I started talking about this, is they understand what you're talking about, but they can't connect to it. And one thing you say is one reason they can't connect to it is they don't commune with nature enough that not only people watching screens, but they live in urban areas. That's why you refer so much to indigenous peoples in your books who have to be part of nature and respect it more. So talk about the scene in South Florida. 
which can literally disappear in terms of human habitation. It was absolutely the most surreal experience of the entire book. So it's very perfect that you bring that up as an example of this disconnect. And it's surreal for many reasons. I mean, when I was there, Rick Scott was still governor. And, you know, as we know, he forbade the use of the terms global warming and climate change by state employees while he was governor. And now, of course, he's senator. But when I was there, you know, the level of denial that is there that's so rampant is it's in your face. And, and as evidenced by these rows of McMansions and Coral Gables right on the coast, you know, going to Miami Beach is really incredible. You know, the amount of money there and what's right at sea level or just within a couple of feet of it. And it's surreal in that at high tides and certainly at king tides, you have people literally walking through flooded streets in broad daylight. There hasn't been any rain or anything. They're literally walking through salt water. Oftentimes you can see fish swimming down the streets and they just, you know, put on rubber boots and walk through it and carry on as, as though everything's fine. And why are they even staying there? Right. I mean, that's what really struck me. And so I went out in Miami Beach, the then city engineer of Miami Beach with Bruce Mallory, who was tasked under the mayor at the time with raising different parts of the streets three feet to try to buy themselves time to prepare for the coming deluge. And yet he knew, he admitted to me openly, like, yeah, we're, we're doing this based on the mid-level projections of the IPCC warnings, even though these are consistently too low. And I asked him, well, why not prepare for the worst case scenario, since that actually seems to be the track that we're on right now, according to, you know, the leading scientists studying sea level. And he just, you know, didn't answer the question. He says, well, we're preparing for mid-level. So that aside, what already was happening is when you raise streets in some areas, then where's that water going to go when it rains and floods? Well, it's going to go down, you know, whatever's below the streets. And so in one instance, a giant high-rise fancy condo, the ground floor of it flooded, and then it couldn't get the insurance money from it because the insurance company said, well, actually, since the streets are raised, that's now a basement, so you're not insured. So you can see just this one tiny little example. You mentioned the groundwater, the aquifer becoming contaminated by salt water. There are a million different ways that this is going to play out catastrophically there. And when I interviewed Dr. Harold Wanless at University of Miami, another sea level rise expert, he said, look, these political leaders, and I know some of them for sure know and understand climate change, their climate disruption is real and these sea levels are coming. And he named Marco Rubio specifically. He said, I know that he knows. And instead of pushing to have a government controlled, mandated and funded evacuation of essentially the entirety of South Florida, a closing down to the Turkey Point nuclear plant that's just south of Miami at six feet elevation, doing remediation of all these environmental toxic sites and getting ready for what is to come and moving archives and museums and hospitals and homes and finding a way to relocate these people to higher ground, a massive project of millions of people. Instead, they're denying that it's even happening. And he said, look, there's only one way I can frame that is the people like Rubio and all the others that are doing this, it's criminal negligence. Well, that's the phrase for, I mean, we really have to up our language. I mean, look, what we're seeing here is political corporate leaders who are taking this planet of ours right down to local communities on the sidal path. The word on the sidal has to be very common. We have the on the sider in chief in the White House, Donald Trump, um, the on the sider in chief. He is telling everybody that climate disruption is a hoax. And there are a lot of people in Congress, Republicans mostly, who are saying it's a hoax. And there are some governors like Rick Scott. It's a hoax. Now, you have billions of people led by politicians and corporations. And by the way, you know, one of your rare references to corporations, you mentioned Exxon Mobil. Listen to this, listeners. 100 corporations in this world account for 71% of the CO2 greenhouse gases released on our planet. And the governments let them get away with it. So we have an omnicidal situation. Now, let me part company here. My belief is only fear is going to drive people to the level of urgency in a declaration of global emergency. It's only fear. It's like people running from a fire suddenly realize that they have to do something to put it out. Because 
although the mass media has not saturated us with the kind of material in your book, they have reported quite a bit of it over time. And not only that, but we've had enough disruptions that we've connected with climate disruption. The fires in California and the floods and in the New Orleans and Gulf area, etc. I don't think anything short of fear. For example, fear of a viral epidemic leads to people getting vaccinated. It's not, you know, just reading about a viral epidemic. It's empirical, sensory fear that's got to do it. And when you describe Florida, the fact that people are not climbing the wall, they're going to lose their homes, they're going to lose their schools, they're going to have to get out of South Florida. If you think this is an exaggeration, listeners, talk to some of the people who were in charge, the chief engineer at Miami Beach and the mayor who left office recently and how endangered Miami Beach is. So the key is how are we going to motivate people to declare this a global emergency? Trump's pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords, which are not even enforceable. They're just voluntary goals. So we're heading for disaster in every continent. And you're Description of the Amazon is totally horrifying. We'll get to that in a moment. But let's talk about if we don't name the main culprits here that are stopping change and causing disaster at the same time, if we don't do that, if we don't take off the shelf the enormous solutions we have to convert very rapidly to renewable energy, much faster than we're doing now with wind power and solar panels on roofs in places like Texas and Georgia creating a lot of jobs. I don't see what's going to happen because if this continues, the reaction of the public is going to be spectacularly dangerous, especially with demagogic politicians and corporatists twisting what we know is true into propaganda. So what's your sense of how do we motivate people? I mean, this book of yours should have been number one bestseller. It should have produced even more stories in Florida. The major press from Florida, you know, in the Washington Post, New York Times, is that the head of the New England Patriots, Robert Kraft, was caught with prostitutes. That's the major story from Florida. This is omnicidal media. What do you say about this, Dar Jamal? Well, I intentionally did not go after the government or corporations in this book because there's a lot of other people doing that and doing a great job of it. This book was essentially an homage to the planet. And it was also a wake up call of, you know, to try to take people to these places since most people, as you mentioned earlier, are living in urban environments and are not getting out into nature enough and certainly not consistently to watch these changes over time. So I tried to bring that to them in a very personal way, along with it being backed by science and voices of people literally on the front lines studying these places. So that's why I, you know, aside from a few cursory ventures into it, like the statistic you mentioned about 100 companies being responsible for 71% of all the CO2, that was not my aim of the book. My aim was to essentially try to reintroduce, reconnect people back into what's happening to the planet. And I had tried, Ralph, for years. I mean, I, this is, I've been now almost 10 years doing stories on climate change for Al Jazeera English, for Truth Out, for other outlets, and horrifying stories. I mean, I wrote about the possibility of human extinction back in 2013 for a piece for Tom Englehart's website that went viral. So I've been pursuing that. And I don't know what does it take really to spark that fear. But, you know, when people, I mean, so far what I can see is like what happened in Paradise, California, when the entire city got incinerated by wildfires. Well, those people get it, that their lives are changed. They're now living in the climate disrupted future. They lost everything. Dozens of people lost their lives. People lost loved ones, everything that they owned. They get it. You know, the people in the panhandle of Florida that just lost everything to hurricanes or in the Carolinas, you know, just this past fall, they get it. So, I don't know, Ralph. I mean, I'm part of me, frankly, is pretty just amazed and my jaw is on the floor. Like the example I gave in Florida, people just put on their galoshes and slog through the water and then go to their job and then come back down to their home and think this is just going to go on in perpetuity. I don't know what it's going to take. I've put out, you know, you read my monthly climate dispatches and each one is a horror show. And so I don't know. I mean, I've tried using, you know, just the fear 
and not sensationalizing anything, but literally just collating the last 30 days of all the scientific studies and putting them in one place. And it's horrifying. I mean, just from the intro of a climate dispatch I just wrote that we're going to run next Tuesday on Truth Out, you know, 2018, the fourth warmest year ever recorded. The only warmer years were 2015, 16, and 17. You know, we're, we're now, according to the Met Office, in the middle of what's going to be the warmest decade since record keeping began. So get ready for more record warmest years. You know, that all glaciers, according to one of the USGS scientists I I went out in Glacier National Park with Dr. Dan Fagri. We'll probably not have any glaciers anywhere in the contiguous 48 by 2100. There'll probably not be any glaciers in Glacier National Park by 2030. They'll They've probably already not- lost most of the glaciers already. This isn't just a future projection, right? No, they used to have 150 when it was a park, and now they're down to 14. They're going faster than anyone projected, even the, even the scientists like Fagri, who was weighing in on it 20 years ago. His jaw's on the ground. We could not have glaciers in the Himalaya by 2100, the highest mountain range on the planet. I mean, I can go down just, I could speak for an hour of just shocking, horrifying, sci-fi level, scary scientific studies. I'm just quoting studies. And I don't, so what is it going to take for people to really, you know, what would beyond that shock people into a level of fear like fires under people's rear ends okay it's time to start taking some seriously radical action and forcing the change in the government that's not happening so far well you put your finger on it what it's going to take is ask the question who has the power to change things dramatically it's the congress and the white house and that's how our focus has got to be and it takes less than 1% of the people reflecting what the majority would like happen in congressional districts to do that. Now, what what exactly do we need? We need a huge reorientation of public investment. We know to get rid of the military empire and direct it to our national survival and how we can help the globe to survive as well. Who can do that? Only Congress can do that. Who can deploy and give great visibility day after day to the experts, to people who've been on the scene like you, reaching tens of millions of people every month in small groups and speaking and lecturing around the country and going to the schools and getting more and more of these kids who are really waking up to this nine, 10, 12 year old kids who are putting it to the politicians when they meet them. Who can do that? That's the Congress. You see, who can take the solutions on the shelf that are being blocked by fossil fuel and nuclear vested interests and get them deployed faster creating all kinds of jobs in residential areas. As Walter Hang of Ithaca has pointed out, a program of energy efficiency that can cut energy use enormously fast in terms of weatherizing homes and and so forth. It's the Congress working with the state legislature. So we're talking 535 people, Dar, who put their shoes on every day like you and I and our listeners. And we're talking 740,000 men, women, and children in each congressional district. You take 1% or even half a percent, and you can turn those people around in Congress fast. So that's the leverage. Just like you have the multiplier closed loop in Greenland with the permafrost melting, you can develop a multiplier effect fast in Congress. Congress can instruct the White House. It's the most powerful branch, obviously, of government and the most personal one. We know their names. So I understand people like Tom Steyer, Al Gore, George Soros, very rich people. They've spoken out again and again on climate disruption, although they still use the word climate change, which is not a way to wake people up. You know, when I was in growing up in New England, our climate change meant summer, autumn, winter, and, and, <laughs> and spring. Right. And they keep saying, well, Congress isn't where the action is. It's gridlocked. It's hopeless. It's back home. But when you organize back home, what's the tool? The tool has got to be the Congress. That's the turnaround lever. And so, you know, I can understand what you're going through, the great experts that you reported in your book, especially Mr. Wandless. We'll talk about him in a minute in Florida, a geologist. They don't focus on that. And that's what leads to the despair and the hopelessness. We changed our economy in World War II so fast that it was stunning. GM began building tanks 
changed his factories from building cars to building tanks in less than a year. We built Liberty ships faster than you can almost count them. That was the war momentum, you see? So we got to get the equivalent of war, war on the disruptors of the global climate and the inanimate disasters that they're producing with the trees and and the forests and the coral and the shores, et cetera. So let's go to Mr. Wanless. Why don't you describe him and what he told you? So Dr. Harold Wanless, he's extremely renowned, prestigious sea level rise expert. He studies it from a paleo perspective. So he's, you know, watches what happens as the earth has gone through all these different eras and epochs. And it is also you know, unlike so many scientists that are much more reserved and are afraid to talk openly about worst case projections and not just IPCC worst case projections, but real worst case projections of how bad things really look like they're going. He's openly critical of the IPCC and other scientists that won't really talk about it. And so he talks about the fact that, you know, he cites, I went in there talking to him about what I had seen on Miami Beach with the city engineer and what another scientist, a colleague of his who is an IPCC author, was talking about the worst case scenario that National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration had just put out at that time for sea level rise by 2100 was 8.5 feet. And that was an upgrade that had happened right when I was there speaking with him. How many feet? 8.5 feet by 2100. What would that do to South Florida? It would be gone. And Wanless interrupted me when I was talking about those two fellows, and he was angry. And he said, look, it's over. We've kicked the bucket. People need to understand 93% of all the heat that we've added into the atmospheres have been absorbed by the oceans. To give you an idea of how much heat that is, if they hadn't absorbed it, the atmosphere today would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is right now. He said, when you have that much heat in the oceans, all the melting from below on, on these ice sheets, like particularly the Western Antarctic ice sheet, and we're seeing this accelerate so dramatically, just even since my book came out, the scientists are scratching their heads. Dr. Eric Rigno, lead author of the study that came out the week that my book was published, a study on the melting across the Antarctic that's happening, and it showed that there was a six-fold increase in melting since just 1970. And when the New York Times interviewed him about that study, his quote literally is, Antarctica is melting away. And so with that happening, that's the single biggest ice source on the planet. And we're seeing similar accelerations in Greenland and other areas. That's why Wanless said that he cites a Hansen, a James Hansen study that came out that said we could see 10 feet by 2050. Wanless said, we, you know, at the rate of exponential change, these runaway feedback loops that are kicking in, collapsing ice sheets, things coming unplugged, we could see 20 feet by 2100, he said. And the thing that I have in the book, that it's really essentially how I ended the section of the book with my interaction with Wanless that really blew me away, was he pointed out that when, when Earth came out of the last ice age and things warmed up and the ice melted, that... CO2 levels in the atmosphere gained about 100 parts per million. And corresponding with that was melting of ice that led to 100 feet of sea level rise. So it's a pretty easy correlation, 100 ppm CO2, 100 feet of sea level rise. So I thought about that for a second and I said, okay, so from when the Industrial Revolution began, it was 280 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere. Now we're at four, it was 410 when I spoke with them, now we're at 414. So I said, okay, now we're at 410. So that's 130 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere increase. So is that 130 feet sea level rise? And he just nodded. Yes. Well, let's make it even more graphic. You cite in your book on page 104, there are four primary reasons why sea levels change. Can you list those? Well, the the first and most obvious is the melting of land-based ice. So ice that's already in the water, over the water, when it melts, it's essentially not going to add any more to sea level rise. So land-based ice is where that's going to be the biggest contributor, which we've just spoken about. And of course, places like the Antarctic and, and Greenland being the key sources. The next one is thermal expansion of the oceans. As water warms, it's basic physics, it expands. So that's a, another big factor. Another one is 
is currents, you know, the way the ocean circulation and the currents are, those are factors as they're changing and as more water is being added into the oceans as the ice melts, those are changing. And then another one is wind patterns. So as wind patterns and with extreme weather events and things like that, and all of these climatic patterns are being disrupted. And this is why I use this term consistently because it's the most scientifically accurate. But as all of these climate patterns are, are changing, the wind patterns are as well. And that's a contributing factor. And that's why you see along the eastern seaboard, specifically in the US, that's the place being hit the most because it's a convergence of really all four of those factors hitting there. And particularly South Florida, as both Wanless and Dr. Ben Kurtman, another sea level rise expert there, told me that literally South Florida and Miami Beach specifically is in the bullseye. It's like the perfect convergence of those four things happening the most intensely and, and particularly bringing in currents and, and wind patterns. And again, so that's why it was so amazing to be at this place that literally is in the bullseye of sea level rise as much or more than anywhere else on the on, on, on Earth. On that point, how long will it be before the Omnicider in Chief's Mar Largo mansion is underwater? Well, it'll be one of the first to go. There's no question about that. And it, it's a matter of acceleration. I mean, literally right now, in the last month, we had another report come out that, again, Dr. Eric Rigno, who I cited earlier, the Thwaites Glacier in the Antarctic, they just found a giant cavity underneath it. It's literally melting out from underneath where it's two-thirds the area of Manhattan and 300 meters high. So that, that much ice just gone. And that glacier is acting as a plug for unlimited potential of sea level rise to come behind it. So it's coming undone as we speak. And so I, I think, you know, the, the possibility of, you know, accelerations happening fast enough to see 10 feet of rise, even by 2050 is not unheard of. So, you know, will, will Trump still be around and alive given his hamburger intake for another 10 years or so? I don't know, but maybe. It, it's the- amazing how people will accurately accuse him of being a racist, a sexist, all those words, Islamophobe, but we've got to start charging him with omnicidal. We have to use that word, omnicidal. People say, what is omnicidal? It starts a discussion. Let's get to the two main responses that have risen to this global meltdown. One is called mitigation, and the other is called adaptation. And talk about it in terms of New York City. David thinks he's pretty secure, you know, in New York City. Talk about it in New York City in terms of a scenario of mitigation and adaptation. What's the hazard to New York City, first of all, in terms of time and flooding? Obviously, sea level rise, and we've already had Hurricane Sandy as kind of a preview of what is to come. So, you know, what happens when the subways become permanently flooded? Or, you know, there's so many consistent extreme weather events and flooding events that those are gone. What happens when streets in the lower parts of the city become permanently flooded or at least consistently flooded enough where they're essentially not usable on a consistent basis? What happens to all the buildings that, you know, the the ground floors, the same thing is happening there. So mitigation is essentially a time buyer. It's essentially, okay, can we build enough walls, install enough protections and pumps, et cetera, to buy us more time to adapt? And that's essential. I think personally, I think most of the energy should be going to adaptation and mitigation, you know, because there's still a lot of people pouring energy into we can fix this, we can change it. And we can't. It's already baked into the system. A lot of the science shows that if we stopped emitting all CO2 emissions on a dime today and engaged in all the mitigation we could hope for, all the governments on the planet started doing the right thing that we've still got at least three sea of warming ahead of us that's already literally baked into the system and for the brunt of that i would cite the statistic i gave about how much of the heat the oceans have absorbed so it's all about mitigation buying time we're not going to fix this we're not going to stop it so how can we mitigate beef up parts of new york city and then prepare for adaptation because planning long-range sane sober planning is not for five feet, not for 10 feet, but if you look at what's baked into the system, and then of course, are we going to stop at 2100 just because, okay, worst case projections, most people talk about end at 2100. I interviewed a leading Antarctic NASA professor emeritus scientist. He said, look at 2200, 2300. We need to be talking about 20 and 30 feet at least. How are we going to prepare for that? And the answer is adaptation. Well, 
I find one way to motivate people, you start with their daily experience. You say, look, would you like to save money and, and have more fuel efficient cars and homes? Yes. Okay. Well, when you have more fuel efficiency, you have less air pollution for you and your kids to breathe. You like that? Yes. Well, then when you have more fuel efficiency and less air pollution, you have a nice side effect. You have fewer global warming gases that go up into the stratosphere and start disrupting the climate. So you start with the pocketbook and you start with the immediate irritation of pollution and health, and then you go to the big issue. What do you think of that? I agree. I think it's brilliant. I mean, I, I think that what people do respond to now, and that's why I cited those catastrophic situations earlier, the, the wildfires incinerating Paradise, California, and hurricanes taking out towns and people's homes and belongings, is you have no choice but to respond to that, right? You, you've taken choice or the, the decision to postpone or uh, we can do this on Friday or I'll look into that next week. But you know, if people understand, no, look, there's a fire coming. It's going to be at your house in 30 minutes. What are you going to do? That kind of urgency. And again, not, I, I, you know, maybe fear is an element of that. But again, just from my own experience of putting out these hard statistics, I do that now to really, I, I use the analogy of, look, if you're going to go do a wilderness trip, do you not want the most accurate map possible that's available so that you can make sure you make good navigation decisions and plan your trip? everyone's going to answer yes. And so, okay, well, this information and these statistics and how far along we already are, it's really hard and scary to hear, but it's the accurate map. So now you have it. And if you really understand that this is, these are the facts, this is the best science that we have right now. And if anything, it's going to be worse than this. So what do you want to do? What decisions do you want to make in your life? What's really, really important what are the things that are most important for you to take care of? And it's going to come down to people's loved ones and their children and you know, their source of income, literally, you know, their own security and how am I able to pay my bills? We were interviewing Paul Hawken. You know, he has a, a list of the worst sources or causes of greenhouse gases. And the first one was re refrigeration, air conditioning, refrigeration, and increasing conversion in India, for example, to more air conditioning because of the stifling heat. So as you increase the heat, you increase the demand for air conditioning, becomes that kind of land surface vicious cycle. But he mentioned two. He said, if we get two, that'll be the best preventer. And I said, what is that? He said, one, give girls education all over the world, and two, reduce population size. And of course, if girls have careers and so forth, they will have smaller families and with more Planned Parenthood, to use the phrase that Trump doesn't like, you have smaller population. Do you think that's, I mean, quite apart from its probability, you think that's the way to go in terms of sort of behavioral change? Or do you favor the leverage of wholesale technological transformations? Well, second one first, uh, wholesale technological transformations are not going to get us there. And besides time, is against us there. And certainly it's the right thing to do to switch over to solar. I mean, I live in a solar powered house. It's, it's certainly the right thing to do to switch over to renewables as abruptly as possible and start eliminating CO2 emissions and all of that. But to think that we can maintain the lifestyle that we have today is, is unrealistic because nothing's going to replace fossil fuels capability to do that. But then getting to the population question, I am really glad to hear that is being spoken of increasingly. I mean, just literally a couple of days ago, AOC, you know, was quoted as talking about, hey, maybe, maybe women need to think about having kids. Maybe it's not the best idea to have kids or have as many kids given this climate crisis that we're in. So it's great to see people, especially someone like that with the publicity she's getting right now, talking about this. It's critical. There's 7.6 billion people on the planet. A lot of scientific studies show the natural carrying capacity for this planet is somewhere around 1 billion people. The reality is some of the most dramatic impacts I think we're going to see, we're already seeing it in a lot of parts of the world, but even the West is going to see it sometime probably in the next handful of years. I'm not going to say a number. I've learned not to make predictions, but we're going to see enough drought consistently that global grain reserves are going to be depleted, enough crop failures, nutritional loss in food, all these things that are happening with increasing warmth and CO2 
that food shocks and things like this and the fact of, of different parts of civilization collapsing from extreme weather events, failed mm -hmm. states, economics, et cetera, when you lose the ability to grow and transport enough food to feed 7.6 billion people, there is going to be a major involuntary population reduction. So the more we can do right now to make that as voluntary and as quickly as possible, the better. You know, we're, we're talking with Dar Jamal, the author of the brand new book, The End of Ice, and he went all over the world to document it. The late great environmentalist, Professor Barry Commoner, once wrote a book, and he said, the first law of ecology is everything is related to everything else. And we've just been given news in the last few weeks, Dar, about the precipitous decline of insects. And I was talking about it with some people, and they say, well, thank goodness. I mean, who, who wants insects? We, we don't like spiders, beetles, mosquitoes. But scientists have said, if we lose our insects, it's the end of the world. That's right. That's right. And that came out in Biological Conservation Scientific Journal that we're losing more than a little over 2% of insects annually. We've already lost, well, it's a rate that shows that we're basically looking at the extinction of 40% of the world's insect species over just the next few decades. And if these trends continue and there's no reason to show, indicate that they're not going to, the trends being impacts of climate change, deforestation, loss of habitat, pollution, et cetera, that we could have no insects at all or functionally extinct, not completely gone, but not enough that exists to make a difference within 100 years. That means we do not have food no more pollination of food, and then everything, of course, that relies on instincts to, to eat from the birds and animals and just go on up the food chain to us. So we are literally that coupled with another study that came out last week about current projections or current trajectories, rather, of CO2 that we're on track to have 1,200 ppm CO2 within about 100 years from now if things continue. Corresponding with that on its own would be a 4C temperature increase of atmospheric temperatures globally, which would automatically then essentially dissolve a stratocumulus clouds around the planet that, were, that cover about one third of the planet. Yeah. Those would essentially go away, which would add immediately another 4C. So that, that study alone is warning us about a possibility yeah. of an 8C temperature increase in 100 years. Not to mention the role of earthworms. Look up the role of earthworms, listeners. You'll be stunned to see their critical role in soil and how many there are per acre right under your feet. Yeah, before we close, any questions from our two stalwart moderators? Yeah, thank you, Ralph. You know, the Republicans always love to talk about Churchill, who saw the, the coming storm. We have a political crisis in America. Have we ever marched in lockstep on a big issue other than World War II? Because this almost requires an authoritarian government to combat this. I don't think we have a system set in place politically to tackle this. It really doesn't appear that we do. And so one of the conclusions I come to in the book that, you know, and I leave political organizing and ways to spark that and generate it and have that happen to you know, I, uh, Ralph, you're it. I mean, <laughs> you, I would vote for you to lead that. And so what I am trying to do in the book is essentially inspire people in their own lives to start making the changes right where they are, start in your own house, go to your community, go to your town mm -hmm. and go to your state. And I'm lucky enough to live in Washington state where, you know, there's a lot of really, really good stuff already going on as far as you know, where are we getting our food and water? What can we do to educate people? What can we do to make this town more resilient? What are we doing to adapt, et cetera? And, and I also want to put out, you know, because so much of what we've talked about is so dire and so extreme and so scary and, and also disheartening that I, I quote Vaclav Havel, the Czech dissident writer and statesman towards the end of the book. And he reminds us that, as he said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. And that's where I get into this moral obligation that no matter how dire things look, that we are absolutely morally obliged to do everything we can in our power to try to make this better, to try to adapt, to try to educate people. To, you know, so all of this activism that's happening, I, I applaud all of it. But my motivation is not 
coming from a place of, you know, I don't know what the results are going to be, but it's imperative to do it simply because it's the right thing to do. So let me ask this question, Dar. Just ideally, I mean, we all know the silliness of the media, the corporate indentured media. Let's assume you're living in an ideal media environment. What would you like to be doing in the next two years to further this book? Well, ideally, if if I could just write the script, I would be on all the major TV programs and talk shows and radio programs as well, talking about having conversations exactly like what you and I have just had, Uh, the talking about this frankly, honestly, openly, letting people know the, the hard facts about how far along we already are, telling the truth, bringing attention to other groups that are doing the same thing, and then ideally continuing to write more books on the subject. I mean, I'd like to go. There's a lot of other places around the world I'd like to go to and and bring that information to people. This book would just be the beginning of that, as well as a project looking at, let's look into how people are, are adapting successfully, because there is a lot of that already happening, too, that's also not getting any attention. But Just like you said, Ralph, I mean, we need media attention. And, you know, I did, I put my heart and soul into this book and I'm doing what I can to promote it. And, you know, but as, as we know, and you better than anybody that, you know, until you really break into that bigger mainstream media, your message is only going to go so far. Well, I hope you get to talk to preteens, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds. They really get it and they know how to shame their elders. And remember that Swedish girl that started at age nine, Greta, she took right. time off from school every week and she just simply stood in front of the Swedish parliament. She certainly knew where the power was, where the leverage is. We need people <laughs> to do that down on Capitol Hill. But I think the rise of youngsters on this issue, and they are very eloquent and obviously they have the biggest stake, can begin certainly getting more media on the subject and begin turning it around. A lot of youngsters years ago asked their parents, why are you still smoking? Don't you want to be around us anymore? Or they say, why don't you use the seatbelt? I want you to be with me in the future. And that, that had a stunning effect on people. I've had people tell me that, including the former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Joe Califano, who's 11 year old came to him once and said, why are you still smoking? Mm-hmm. Uh, I want my father to be around. And uh, he stopped and started an anti-addiction group at Columbia University. So on that hopeful younger generation note, thank you very much, Dar Jamal. And don't climb so many dangerous mountains in Argentina. We need you for many years. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ralph. And it's really my honor to be on your show. I really appreciate it. And stay in touch. We'll, we'll do it again. Thank you. Look forward to it. We have been speaking with independent journalist Dar Jamal. We will link to the end of ICE at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now we're going to take a short break and check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. When we come back, Ralph is going to answer some of the questions you've sent us. Back in a minute. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Report on Morning Minute for Friday, March 8, 2019. I'm Russell Mokhyber. The Labor Department is investigating Fidelity Investments over an obscure and confidential fee it imposes on some mutual funds. That's according to a report in the Wall Street Journal. The annual charge, which Fidelity calls an infrastructure fee, is aimed at companies selling shares on the Asset Managers Fund platform and was described in a 2017 internal Fidelity document reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. The fee, which appears to have been implemented in 2016, is designed to ensure that each fund firm meets a minimum required payment to Fidelity. By marking the charge as an infrastructure fee, the fund firms may be able to avoid disclosing it to investors, the journal reported. Fund companies that decline to pay the amount will be subject to a very limited relationship with the company, the document says. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokheimer. Thank you, Russell. So we've got some listener questions we're going to do. David, why don't you take the first one? I love this question. It's from David Kowalski. He listens to us on KPFA. I believe that's in Berkeley. Hi, Ralph. Love your show. Very inspiring each week. I'm really intrigued with the comment attributed to you about not getting caught up in mood swings. What's your secret to this? Do you meditate and practice yoga mindfulness? Is it your upbringing or genetic disposition? Are you a follower of the philosophy of the ancient Stoics? I was a little floored when I heard this comment on today's show. No, none of the above, David. I just focus on the task at hand and 
I don't like to surrender. So perhaps it's not liking to surrender and give in to people and corporations and government agencies who aren't playing fair with the people in this country and around the world. It's pretty simple. That's the way I grew up. Something is unjust, you work to make it just. You don't get discouraged to a point where you're not functional. And you don't get pessimistic because it has no function at all. And you remain upbeat, and keep going, and you get strength from your various victories, as modest they may be. And you learn from your last mistake. And I suppose, Ralph, it has to do with taking a long view and knowing that, I think it was Gandhi who said, you lose, you lose, you lose, you lose, you lose, then you win. And knowing that step backward could be on the way to a few steps forward, right? That's true. A lot of people give up on the first try. They get discouraged and disillusioned. But if you know that you're going to often have to lose and lose, but you're gaining ground as you lose, you're learning, you're getting allies, and you keep going. But there's no function to pessimism. Just eradicate it. When Nixon resigned in 74, did you delude yourself in thinking it's full steam ahead now? It's just nothing but blue skies? For what? Well, just it seemed like in 74 after Nixon resigned, the environmental movement was full steam ahead. The civil rights movement was chugging along. Did you think we would hit this wall? No, I didn't. Uh, I knew there'd be a corporate counterattack. There always is in American history when they lose ground and have to behave themselves and be regulated. But I, I never thought it would be this pronounced. And partly because of the Electoral College, which elected two Republican presidents, George Bush and Donald Trump, and partly because the people took the advances in health and safety, such as safer automobiles and cleaner air, for granted, as if you know they didn't require constant citizen vigilance over the polluters and the corruptors and the cheaters in the marketplace. And that combination gave people like the Koch brothers and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable the opportunity to recapture Washington big time. Well, thank you for that question, David. I want to thank our guest again today, Dar Jamal. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we speak with Rania Milleron and Nicholas Sakalaru about ethics and engineering. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. And if there's ever a book you need to read, listeners, The End of Ice by Jar Jamal. He went all over the world and conveyed the message to you. Hello, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Welcome to the wrap-up, where Ralph, David, and Steve do a free-ranging post-mortem on the end of ice and then segue into some current events. David, does this make you want to read the book? Well, I'll read it because you... It's a beautifully written book. I'm telling you, it's not just a bunch of statistics. I mean, it's kind of scary. Not kind of yeah. scary. It's, it's very scary. It almost feels like there's nothing we can do. And it isn't just rising sea level, it's the surges, you know, like when a hurricane comes and you have a rising sea level and then it takes it and galvanizes it even more inland. It's, it's like what, you know, the hurricane that hit New York was on a bigger scale. Yeah. You want to know the NRC licensed the Turkey Point, which is right on the water, <laughs> to build two more nuclear plants, but it was too expensive. They had to drop it. That's the omnicidal nature. Imagine, after Fukushima, the NRC Mm. says to Turkey Point, which has its own aging and corrosion problems, you can build two more. Yeah. Speaking of that, we got a lot of response to the nuclear show with Greg Yasko. And it's people arguing back and forth on our webpage, the efficacy of you know, these molten salt reactors that they talk about are thorium reactors and yeah. people sending us links to, you know, <laughs> you see, the latest. They only have two arguments. One is the climate change, which is nonsense because you put the money into solar and wind that you put into a nuclear plant, you get 10 times safer energy and better. Yeah. The other thing is they always have these new models. I mean, when I was in Oak Ridge in 1963, they were talking about, don't worry, we're going to have better nuclear plant. Now, all this all these new models and one will be small small you can fit it in your pantry 
what I was you thinking. You like the idea of, of making omnicidal and uh, the omnicider a popular yeah. word? I hadn't heard it before, and I actually looked it up, and it, it actually is a word. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not surprising to me. The omnicider in chief. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, you can't use homicide or suicide. It's omnicide. Yeah. And then he puts in, in charge of all these agencies, the worst enemy of the agency, whether it's John Bolton or Scott Pruitt or yeah. the guy who took his place, the cold guy. Wheeler. I mean, it's unbelievable what's happening. Yeah. You know, well, David I, said, that would I ever predict? Who would ever predict these kinds of monstrosities and the lack of 100,000 people around the White House 24 hours a day? Get the hell out. Well, I was on a ski trip this weekend, and at this cabin was that the Fire and Fury book, which I... Fantastic. Just in I, terms of sexy reads. Well, it was, and I thought it was just going to be this gossipy thing. So I thought, okay, pick it up. And it was actually a lot better than journalistically than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. And he, but he paints a portrait of a guy who does not read, does not have the attention span to listen to any sort of long briefing. And is mm -hmm. just kind of this empty suit yeah. who just, it's, it's about his power and his winning. And so what hadn't been clear to me before was that there were three factions trying to fill him up, which is Bannon on the one side. This is in the early, you know, the first two years. Bannon, who, you know, the alt-right guy who actually went through all of Trump's speeches trying to find some sort of coherent philosophy <laughs> and basically couldn't. So he just tried to make, you know, Trump be his vessel. Then there was Reint Priebus who represented the corporate Republican Party and Congress. So they're trying to fill Trump with their ideas. And then the third factor was Jared and Ivanka, who were essentially what he called Goldman Sachs Democrats, mm -hmm. corporate Democrats. They are the ones who brought Gary Cohn in to be his mm -hmm. economic advisor. And they're in with him, obviously, was being family. So there were these three competing ideologies or approaches trying to maintain his attention. And that's why nobody ever left meetings. And every meeting they had, everybody was there, whether they had something to say or not, because they knew that the last person who talked to him is the person who would have the most influence. So it's really <laughs> What's the name scary. of the book again? Fire and Fury. It's the Michael oh, yeah, Wolf yeah. book that came yeah. out. But and by the way, you know, he had last week, he had his Captain Quig moment, two hours of total ranting. Oh, they yeah. ought to use that during the presidential campaign. In fact, he recognized him that he was going off the rails. He, yeah. From time to time, you'd say, "I'm going," you know, "I'm, I'm going off here." I'm. Yeah. Well, in two-hour speech in this Michael Wolf book, he prints verbatim the speech that it was one of the first speeches Trump gave when he took office. He was at the CIA because they wanted him to mend fences at the in the intelligence mm -hmm. agencies, and he just prints this speech. And I didn't hear the CPAC speech, but this one was just a mishmash. Talk about off the rails, just going back and free associating between how great his victory was and, you know, then mentioning, oh, what I'm hearing. Yeah, Mike Pompeo. <laughs> and, and, pra and praising yeah. the CIA to the sky. I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah praising them to the sky, but then <laughs> going off on a tangent about his electoral victory and then realizing, but, oh, wait a minute, that's not why I'm here. I got to come back to this. It's just. Well, he's still in his two hour speech before CPAC. He still was talking about the record crowds at my inauguration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the guy, the guy is nuts. He's total nuts. as Captain Quig. Yeah. Yeah. This, Talk about this, somebody who doesn't do mood swings. To end the week after failing in Vietnam and to have your own attorney call you what he called him to get yeah. to be able to get up there. I would have I, I would have been paralyzed after that week. Oh, no. You know what he how he used that? He said how unpatriotic to do that while the president is trying to negotiate an important treaty overseas. Unprecedented. Yeah. The horrible Democrats doing this to America. Let's hope he doesn't get it. Listen, uh, I don't mind him flirting with these dictators. The worst thing is if he doesn't flirt and sends missiles. Right, right. So I, I don't mind him saying good things about Putin and, and the guy in North Korea. 
Because the one thing he, he said right is, hey, they're not testing anymore, are they? Well, no. Well, there's evidence now that they are, that they're actually rebuilding the plant that they uh, No, but I mean, they're not, they're not firing missiles. They're not, no. And we're not provoking them with South Korean maneuvers. War right. Maneuvers. Right. So you got to so, give that credit. But what did you uh, think of Cohn saying, I don't think he's going to engage in a peaceful transition of power should he lose? That's very ominous. I wouldn't be sorry because it, by definition, any loss is, is due to fraud. Yeah. By definition. Well, I mean, he, he, he had three million aliens coming in to vote for Hillary to account for Hillary's three million plurality. Yeah. He has to be declared 25th Amendment. Yeah. We're relying on Pence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Does, does hey. McConnell, is McConnell a patriot? Is McConnell, if you corner him? No, say- no, he's the worst of the worst. All he wants to do is put right wing judges on and stop everything from happening that the Democrats want. He's a stopper. He's the worst. But if if Trump were to refuse to leave office? Only if his ass is on the line. Yeah. And he's up for a reelection, fortunately, in 2020. Yeah, the Democrats, you know, they don't go into the backyards of these people, the way Gingrich went into Foley's backyard, the speaker, and dumped him. They ought to start working in Kentucky right now. He's the worst campaigner of all, but they don't have anybody opposing him who can win. They're terrible candidates. He's the worst campaigner of any leader in American history. I don't know how you say that, Ralph. He seems very scintillating. (laughs) He's terrible on the hustings. And now Ralph answers more of your questions. Uh, Our next question comes from Cheryl Richard, and we like this kind of question because it's a single line. She wants to talk about the Federal Reserve, and her question is, Shouldn't we nationalize the Fed? Well, that's a probing question because we're the only country in the Western world that doesn't have the central bank as part of the exchequer, as they call it in England. In other words, part of our Treasury Department. And as a result, it's out there controlled by the big banks and the financial industry. And that's actually who funds it. The Federal Reserve is not funded by congressional appropriations. It's funded by the banking industry. And there's a nice shuttle back and forth between Federal Reserve people and the various branches around the country and banks. Very incestuous behavior. So answer your question, it should be brought back as part of the U.S. Treasury Department, which at least is in law accountable to the Congress. When you say it's funded, the the banks have to pay a kind of tax that goes into the Treasury, and then the Treasury cuts a check to the Federal Reserve. Yeah, the banks pay for Federal Reserve services and so forth, and that amounts to the Fed's budget. Our next question comes from Chris Sundberg. He says, Ralph, I assume the Center for Automotive Safety would be a supporter of robot cars. What better way to save 50,000 lives per year, reduce insurance, reduce health care costs for injuries, and put half the lawyers out of work? Well, let's assume it's going to work. We don't know. There's too much secret data behind the hype of the various companies. They don't share the data. They don't give it to the Department of Transportation. So, so far, it's hype. Semi-autonomous brakes, of course, work and other semi-autonomous things. But I assume, Chris, you're talking about a totally self-driving car with no steering wheel. You just get into the car and it takes off. There are a lot of unresolved problems, how these cars are going to relate to cars on the road with drivers, uh, ruts on the road, bad weather, bicycles, animals, darting kids. And the biggest question of all that the industry of driverless car promotion doesn't answer, hacking. There is no defense against hacking, whether by the company that sold you the car or the auto dealer that wants you to pay your installment loan payment on time or by nefarious people. In fact, the hacking could hack a model, say a Toyota model with 500,000 cars, and suddenly these cars start swerving. So the last thing the industry can tolerate is public distrust. If they don't get the public's trust, you can forget about the driverless car future. There should be much more emphasis on public transit. There's too much emphasis on hype, and unproven driverless car technology. 
We have marvelous public transit, which in a way is a driverless vehicle for all the people sitting and being conveyed safely in volume to their destination. You know, that happened to me. I drove up to the Tort Museum in Connecticut to hear you speak, and I rented a car, and I parked the car on 116th Street to get a cup of coffee. I go back to start it, and it won't start. And I had no idea why it wouldn't start. They turned me off. I was two hours late. And instead of calling me to tell me that, you know, I'm two hours yeah. late, the car wouldn't start. And I had a, I had no idea. And I had to call them to restart yeah, the car. You know, there, there was a car that was demobilized by a used car dealer in Detroit because the driver was late on payments. And he was driving along the highway and suddenly the engine stopped. So <laughs> hacking is the Achilles heel of the driverless car industry. Well, that doesn't sound like it. hacking. That sounds like just part of the business model. Yeah, well, that's, that's yeah. true. You can give it another adjective, but, you know, it's, it's, shall we say, taking control of the car by remote actors away yeah. from the driver. If there's anything to freak out drivers and get them to oppose driverless cars is that they're driving along and they may lose control of their brakes, their engine, and whatever else relies on software. Because Listen, that's the whole ethos okay. of driving is the idea of freedom, that we've yeah, got right. freedom. That's, right. Yeah. And that takes that's it away. That's another part of it. Yeah. People like Listen. to drive cars. They, they like to be by themselves in charge of a car going where they want. Listening to today's show, I now understand why Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos want to get the hell out of here while they're launching rockets to Mars and the moon. It's the, <laughs> if I were I that rich. another reason why Jeff Bezos wants to get out of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, just imagine the national park budget for over 100 national parks, Yosemite, Yellowstone, is a little over $3 billion. And there's a lot of deferred maintenance and repair that is not going on. In the meantime, the Omnicider in chief pushed Congress to pass another $84 billion, billion dollar expansion of the military budget that the generals didn't even ask for. So you can see Omnicider in chief produces Omnicider consequences. Well, and just on another tangent, the fact that he wants this wall and will blithely take it away from that military budget that he so assiduously fought for kind of puts the lie to the fact that that money was needed in the military budget at all. Yep. Yeah. Many other put the lies to, too, on that subject. And that's a wrap. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we talk about whistleblowers who save lives. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting ready.